<coughs> Notes I've got for today to finish things off. So this this will be it for formal presentation of material. Um, the documents that I'm working from, or the slides are going to be coming from, are ones that are Roman numeral three and four. I think the fourth one, I forgot to change the name on it, so this is like unit two, so it's at the bottom of the list. They're in the bonding folder. Now this is going to be an overview of material. Uh, your the details of which you're going to fill in when you go through and read. Okay. Um, we're going to be looking at stuff in terms of you know, relation, <coughs> relationships, how can we compare things, uh, but in these, in this set of slides, pretty much just definitions and introducing some stuff that you may not be familiar with, okay? Questions? Okay, so we'll make this go as fast as possible. What? All right. <coughs> gases. We've already covered gases. This was in first semester. Okay. Uh, these properties we're already familiar with. Gases fill the expand to fill the container. They're in constant random motion. Um, translational motion. It's basically saying you're going to travel in straight lines until they collide with something. The thing that's relevant to us, or the most important part, is that there are approximately zero intermolecular forces. Now, this is true for what we would consider to be an ideal gas, but there are no such things as ideal gases. For the purposes of the calculations and stuff that we do with gases, we assume that there are no intermolecular forces. If there were, they would affect the volume and pressures. So, <coughs> We know that real gases do form liquids. You can eventually turn them into solids. So there are intermolecular forces between molecules in a gas. The difference is, is that at the temperatures that we are normally dealing with them, the intermolecular forces are negligible. We don't worry about them. Liquids. Liquids have much more in common with solids than they do with gases. So they have a fixed volume, as do solids. <coughs> they can flow, so that's that's definition of a liquid. So you're, anything that's going to be a liquid is going to be able to flow. It's not going to have a definite shape. <coughs> Whatever it's in is going to take the uh, shape of that container. Most liquids are only slightly compressible, and I say that in terms of the fact that it, they don't have zero compressibility. It's just they're not very compressible. You are not going to be able to compress a liquid. You can use an industrial press, things like that, to cause enough pressure to cause the volume to decrease a little bit, but it is not going to be that much. <coughs> Solids are incompressible. So the two, that's why I said earlier that liquids have much more in common with solids than they do with gases. Uh, intermolecular forces, if you're talking about uh, a liquid, it's intermolecular forces that are holding those molecules together, keeping them the strong enough attraction to keep them from coming apart into a gas. And again, translational motion. They move in straight lines until they collide with something and then they move on in a straight line. It's just they're not going to be able to move as far as a gas would be able to move. Any questions? Is that still recording? Yes. Yeah. Is it aimed up here, these board and screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You read all the fun. I was going to be like halfway through. I was going to be like, is it supposed to be recorded? <coughs> 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 
I'm just so funny, dude. Yeah. So, I mean, I have another period to do it. Okay, so liquid properties. Uh, these are things we've talked about in the first year class, but because we've had mixed up years over the last three school years, um, I'm not sure how much you have been introduced to these before. So adhesive forces versus cohesive. Adhesive is the attraction between different materials. In the adhesive forces, the reason why I have thick tape is because it's an adhesive. Glues are adhesives. So they're going to be holding different things together. Cohesive forces then are going to be forces of attraction between like particles. So water molecules attracting other water molecules. Those are going to be cohesive forces. These two properties, adhesive and cohesive for forces, end up giving us <coughs> certain, <coughs> certain properties, especially regarding surface tension. So in this diagram here, I need to freeze this so I can zoom in. So in this diagram here, this is showing how the molecules are going to be interacting at the surface and in the middle of the liquid. So at the surface of the liquid, we have a difference here in the attractions because the surface molecules, they don't have any molecules up above attracting them. So what this means is that our net attraction is going to be inwards towards the liquid. So the surface molecules are all being pulled inwards because that's the only direction that's, that's taking place. In the middle of the liquid, those molecules are being pulled in all directions. Now, I'm not saying individually each of these is weaker. I'm just saying the net effect is that the surface molecules are being pulled into the liquid versus molecules within the liquid being pretty much equally attracted in all directions. Because of that, that makes it difficult to break through the surface. And this is what we get with what we call surface tension. <clears throat> surface tension is that strong, it's, it's, the, it's the result of those attractions and the molecules being pulled inwards that at the surface of the molecule makes an area that's gonna be a little bit harder to break apart the molecule. The picture of the water bug, water bugs don't float. They sit on top of the water. If you want to make water bug sink, put soap in the water because it disrupts the surface tension. This is what detergents do, okay? So when you're, you know, like detergents for cleaning dishes and for, or for laundry, those things change the intermolecular forces between the water molecules by adding compounds, adding molecules in there that are going to distribute those attractions differently. <clears throat> um, viscosity is resistance to the flow. You know how it is to pour water out of a container. If you pour oil out of a container, that oil acts differently. That's because its, it's viscosity is different. Um, <coughs> hand lotions. They're for the most part a liquid. And you're here to take this. Test. Yes. And I have one with your name. Okay.
<coughs> hand lotions and stuff have uh, thickening agents in them, things to keep all the different stuff mixed together, but you can pour them out. They are a liquid. They're just going to be a hot, very, very viscous liquid. Now, the one thing I don't have on this describing is described in the picture here. This is the meniscus for water. This is the meniscus for mercury. Now, when in our glassware, the reason why we have a meniscus is because we have kind of competing forces here. We've got the water molecules, which are going to be attracted to the glass, but we also have the water molecules attracted to themselves. That's why you get that curved shape. So the water is going to kind of creep up the sides of the um, container if it's glass because the water molecules are attracted to it, but the water is pulling those molecules inwards and that's why you get that shape con that concave. In mercury, mercury has very little, if any, attraction to the glass. Almost all of the attraction is within the liquid itself. Thank you. So the molecules are pulling themselves in and if, if, if not in this container, they would form a more spherical shape. If you've ever seen mercury, pictures of mercury, droplets of mercury, droplets of mercury on a surface look like, I can't do it over here, look like this. because the attraction between the molecules, the cohesive forces, are much stronger than any of the adhesive forces. Questions? Mr. K, yeah. does the mercury then, like, is it going outward or inward? What do you mean? Like the molecules, do they like go inward or outward? They're being, they're, so they're being pulled inwards. So in here, if we were to draw a diagram like this, they're all going to be pulling in. What we don't have at the surface like we do here is these molecules of the mercury are not, not I should say atoms of mercury, they're not attracted to the sides of the container. And that's why they pull in like this without being, you know, drawn up the sides. Okay. <coughs> Solids, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, <coughs> definite shape and volume, they're relatively incompressible. I say relatively because there is still space in between the molecules and, and atoms that make up a solid. Uh, if you were to measure the volume of mercury and you're using the meniscus, would you measure from the top? Yes. But usually we're not going to wait. Or, or, mercury is not used as a liquid enough. If it was being used as liquid, you more than likely would weigh it by mass versus volume. Um, and one of the main reasons there for that is that our glassware is designed and calibrated for aqueous solutions. So the curve and stuff is taken care of, taken into account there. But yes, if I was if I was going to have you use you know liquid mercury, you'd want to measure the top of the meniscus. Um, old school mercury barometers, um, which worked on the principle of <coughs> you had a pool of mercury. We used to have them, they're really, really nice barometers, but they told us we had to get rid of them because they had mercury. mercury. So what you had then is what, what basically what you do is you fill a tube of mercury. You cap it, you invert it into the pool of mercury and uncap it. Now, if you do that with water, water is going to stay all the way up to the top. With mercury, mercury's mass, its density is great enough to where 
its weight will pull it down. Now, how far it's going to pull it down depends. So inside of this, we would have liquid mercury, and up here is a vacuum. Now, it's close to a vacuum. Actually, you're going to have a little bit of mercury vapor because it turns from a liquid into a gas, but not enough to worry about. The height of this will go up and down based on what the atmospheric pressure is. So when I say, when a weatherman says the mercury is rising, or they used to, I think now they just say the pressure is rising. But when they used to say the mercury is rising, that's because the mercury in this would literally be rising up. And when you measured this, you measured it from the top of the meniscus. So if the air pressure was pushing down harder, it would push mercury up into it. That's your high pressure. But yeah, you would read the top of it. Our glassware, though, is calibrated for water. It'd probably get you close enough, but you're never going to use liquid mercury. It's the the <coughs> the toxic properties of it far outweigh the usefulness of it. Yeah. Okay. So metallic bonding. So we've talked about ionic bonding, you're familiar with that. We've talked about covalent bonding, you're familiar with that. The third type of chemical bond, or third type of bonding is called metallic bonding. We're not gonna go into great detail about it. Uh, the details of metallic bonding are rather complex. There's a lot of quantum properties involved. We're gonna use a very simple model for the bonding that occurs in metals. Uh, it's called C model of bonding, where <coughs> in metals, the valence electrons have fairly low ionization energies. When metals come together, their electron clouds are going to overlap, and essentially, the electrons are not strong enough attracted to its own atom, nor is it more overly strongly attracted to the other atom, that the electron cloud kind of just throws all the valence electrons in one big pot. So you got a cloud of these electrons, and interspersed in that cloud of electrons, you have these atoms, so these represent the nucleus and the core electrons of the atoms in the metal. Now, <coughs> the mutual attraction then between these positively charged metal atoms and the negatively charged electrons is what holds it all together. We don't necessarily think of there being a specific bond between this and this, or this and this. What there is, is a strong attraction for all these electrons. Now, this gives metals the properties that they have. So if I were to hit this with a hammer, so I have an atomic hammer, I'm going to be able to hit specific atoms with my atomic hammer. Not too bad, right? If I were to hit it right here, I'm going to be affecting this atom of metal, okay? Now, if I were to hit a metal with a hammer, what's going to happen to it? Squish. Dent, squish, what? Clang. Clang? Yeah. Yeah. Logan, what did you say? I said probably not. Well, it depends on the metal. It depends how hard you hit it. It depends on how hard, how hard it hit. If I'm hitting it hard enough to intend to dent it, it's probably going to deform in some way. Yes. Okay. How much? So, the deformation that takes place is different than if I were to hit, like, say, a pane of glass. 
If I walked up to that window right now and hit it with a hammer, I'd be in trouble. Okay. What's going to happen to it? It's going to shatter. Now I'm pretty sure it's safety glass, meaning it's got code, it's coated with plastic in there, so it's not just going to be glass flying everywhere. But there's going to be a nice little place where it's broken, and <coughs> you're going to have shards of glass. The reason why that's going to happen or not happen with this is that the atoms that make up this metal, because they're all attracted in this sea of electrons, and these electrons are mobile, they can move around. If I were to force this downwards, well, that's going to increase the repulsions between these two atoms, but all of the electrons are going to rearrange themselves around this to reduce that and keep things from flying apart. In an ionic compound where I have alternating positives and negatives, it's the attractions between these positive and negatives that keep it together. Now, if I were to hit this with a hammer, if I hit that right there, what's going to happen to these ions? Uh, the positive ion will shift down, come closer to the other positive ions, and also make a mess, probably. Yep, it's going to make a mess. Because if I force those down to ions that are same charge and now put them closer together, what's going to happen? They're going to break apart because they're going to repel. This is why, this is why ionic compounds are going to shatter if you hit them with a hammer. Glass is not ionic, but it's going to shatter because it's going to change how those atoms, their arrangement, and in glass, the arrangement of the atoms is pretty much stuck in place. There's not a lot of room for movement. Now, obviously, we've got different types of glasses, right? Um, your phones, your iPads, they're all, you know, phones now are all glass front and back for the most part, okay? Those glasses, though, that they use are much, much more resistant to breaking and cracking than they were before. Now, I don't know the... I don't know the mechanics behind that and stuff, but obviously there's got to be a little bit of flexibility in there to be able to resist those breaks. Or if there are, if, if it is for it breaking, or sorry, quote unquote breaking, maybe at the molecular level there's some deformation that's occurring, but it's not propagating outwards. Okay, so you're reducing that chance. Um, I don't. Yeah, you're going to get screens to completely shatter now, but not like you did five, six years ago. Okay, drop a phone and boom, you got entire shards of glass coming off everywhere. Now drop a phone and it's got like a little bit of where it hit, and then you got maybe two or three cracks going across the screen. You don't have the whole screen breaking apart. Again, like I said, I don't know what the mechanics are behind that, but obviously there's lots of research going into that. Okay, <laughs> so we've got these electrons able to move around. Uh, that also allows metals to conduct electricity well, because to be able to conduct electricity, you have to have particles, charged particles that can move. As long as you get charged particles that can move, you can conduct electricity. Now, conducting electricity in metals is not like feeding water through a hose. The electrons just don't flow through. A electrical current is very chaotic for the most part. If, <coughs> so this electron in an electrical current, the net direction is that way but this electron is probably going to bump into that one. That one's going to bump into that one. That one's going to bump into that one. That one's going to move over here, and it's going to affect these. 
<coughs> it's not a straight line process. The electron's not going to move far from where it was to begin with. This is why some metals heat up when you turn the electricity on. Like an electric stove, you turn an electric stove on, you get the red hot wire. That's made of metal, but the properties of that metal are not like the same properties in your chair. They're not the same properties in your car. You wouldn't want to use the metal that's making up the, the heating element on an electric stove to build something with. <coughs> so one of the best conductors of electricity is gold. Because gold's very soft. That means that those atoms and the electrons, they're relatively easy to move around in this place. But it's also why you don't use gold to make something that you want to be structurally sound because it's going to bend. <clears throat> and also good conductors of heat in general. Now the most common thing that the uh, AP exam has asked about on recent tests has been this definition or distinguishing between different types of alloys. Now an alloy is a mixture of metals. <coughs> Technically it's a solution, but the two different types of alloys you have are what's called substitutional alloys or interstitial alloys. And the difference between them is basically what size comparison do you have between the atoms that are involved? A substitutional alloy is going to be an alloy where your metal A and metal B, whatever they happen to be, they're going to have the similar size to each other. Meaning that you would be able to take atom A out of that structure, replace it with atom B, and it's not going to change significantly. Now, there is going to be a change. It's why we use alloys. So, <coughs> this would be like using silver uh, and palladium, maybe some copper, even though copper's on another row, to make a jewelry that's going to be structurally sound enough, maybe even a little more resistant to corrosion. Silver is very, can corrode very easily. Interstitial alloys are where you're going to have in the alloy, you're actually going to put extra atoms of an element in between or the spaces in between the metal that you're mixing it with. The best examples of this are going to be like uh, iron, uh, cast iron, sometimes called pig iron. Um, iron on its own doesn't have some strength properties throw some carbon atoms in there to take up some space, and now you have a much stronger metal. So depending on what you have in terms of the atoms being mixed, you can have very widely differing properties. As I mentioned earlier, you don't use gold to make things. Gold is very soft, pure gold, very soft. So jewelry shouldn't be soft especially rings. Rings need to hold their shape. You make gold, make a gold, pure gold ring, and it's going to deform. Just wearing it, you're going to bend it. Mix it with other metals. <coughs> Generally, uh, gold it gets mixed with copper or platinum and some silver, and that's going to give it some strength that the gold by itself would not have different types of gold, white gold, pink gold, uh, or rose gold. Those are all gonna be gold mixed with other elements 
to give them a different color. Uh, so 18 karat gold is 18 24ths gold and the other 6 24ths something else. Again, usually copper usually. Why copper? It's not that much different than gold is. Yeah, I know it's got a reddish orange color versus gold, but if you start mixing silver with gold, the silver is going to take away from the gold color. Stainless steel is a good example that's been used and referenced on the AP exam. In stainless steel, you mix uh, your iron with chromium. And as, like it says here, it's a minimum of 11%. There are different grades of stainless steel. I mean, metallurgy, huge area, okay? I know that uh, the, the metal that you use in cars now is very different than the metal that was used in cars back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's much stronger and lighter. Now, <clears throat> chromium is put into that because chromium will react with oxygen in the air just like iron reacts with oxygen in the air. But the difference being is that the chromium is pretty much colorless to us. When iron reacts with oxygen in the air, it goes from this gray metal to this red-orange rust. This is where the stainless part comes in. A stainless steel, you can stain it. It can get discolored, depending on what you're, what, what's being coming into contact with it. <clears throat> but the chromium that's in there is going to react with the oxygen before the iron will. And when it does react with the oxygen, it forms a coating on that metal that helps protect it from other oxygen coming in. That's why the resistance to the corrosion. That's why, I don't know when they made the switch, but in cars, exhaust systems are now made primarily with stainless steel. It's an expensive upfront cost. But I remember grow, it, growing up, in the 70s and 80s, you had to get the exhaust system on a car changed out about once every five years. And that's, so after your third exhaust change, you're already now in the hole compared to if you had changed it out the first time or had bought the car with stainless steel. I've got 2009 Civic that I've never had anything done to the exhaust. So what, how old is that? 13 years old. So in that car, by now, I probably, back in the 70s and 80s, I probably would have had to have had the exhaust changed three times. But that's because it's got a stainless steel exhaust system. Questions so far? Covalent solids network. Okay, so there are different types of solids dealing with covalent compounds. <coughs> now, a network covalent solid is going to be where all of the atoms that are involved are going to be covalently bonded in a network of bonds. I'll try to get that to pause here in just a second. But So <coughs> on the left-hand side, you've got a diamond. This is the model of the diamond. I'll pass this around. In this, you have at the um, intersection, each one of these black balls would represent a carbon atom. Those carbon atoms are bonded to four other carbon atoms. 
that means that the shape here, or I just, let's go back backwards. What's the Vesper notation if there's no long pairs and it's got four bonds? That means the shape here is what? They're all tetrahedral. So each carbon atom has a tetrahedral structure around it where it's bonded to four other carbon atoms. This is what we call a network covalent solid because we have a network of covalent bonds attaching all of the things together. Diamonds, as you can see here, have an extremely high melting point. Now, if you want to overbreak, try to melt some diamond. One, good luck getting something hot enough to do that. But two, you're going to need to do it in a vacuum because you're going to burn your carbon before you melt your carbon. Because carbon is just, or car, diamond is just carbon. It's going to react with the oxygen in the air if you get it hot enough. Then you're just going to have a charred piece of diamond all figured out. Okay. So let me know how that experiment sounds like a challenge. I'll let you know. Okay. So. Now, graphite is also just carbon. So if graphite's just carbon, it's got completely different properties. Diamond is the hardest naturally occurring so substance. Graphite is very soft. But graphite's soft because of its structure. That's pretty good. So in this structure, we can see that we have planes of atoms separated from each other. Now, <coughs> what's not being shown here is that these layers of carbons, they are bonded to each other between the layers. But the bond between the layers is different than what the bond is within the layer. <clears throat> the bonds between the layers, much weaker than the bonds within the layers. Not too bad. So, what we've got here is, and I'll, I'll, I'll use these up here. We've got this, atom, <coughs> this carbon atom <coughs> bonded to two other carbon atoms. Oh, Christ. So this carbon atom is bonded to these two carbon atoms. If we were to continue this structure, there would be a third carbon atom out here. So every one of these carbon atoms is covalently bonded to three others on the same plane. Therefore, its shape is what? Trigonal planar. planar. Whereas that was what? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. Okay. So we have a different structure. The bonds between, the attractions between the layers of the carbon atoms, they are different than the bonds holding these together. This is your difference between sigma and pi bonding, by the way. Okay? So when you write with a pencil, what you are doing is you're basically shearing off layers. you're sharing off a layer of carbon atoms each time you write. So if you were to look at it under a microscope, you'd see these thin little sheets of carbon that you've laid down. And that's how a pencil's gonna work. But both of these are called network covalent solids because all of the atoms are covalently bonded to other atoms. Other examples, carborundum, 
Carborundum is a, a cheaper version of a, a substance like diamond that's used in cutting tools. Uh, you coat the uh, saw blade or drill bit with carborundum, and it'll cut through metal and stuff much more efficiently and for a longer period of time. Covalent, network covalent solids, they tend to be very hard. Quartz, basically sand, also is going to be a network covalent solid. Quartz is one of the main ingredients in glass. That's why glass doesn't, it doesn't bend well, because they're pretty much stuck in place. <clears throat> Questions? Ionic solids, I think they're pretty self-explanatory. I don't think there's much more that I need to go over other than to say that you've got your positives and negatives attracted to each other. We've also looked at this table already, so I'm just going to reference it quickly. Remember when we looked at this first time, we were looking at the trends with uh, chemical bonding and the attractions between the particles. And we saw that as we go from top to bottom here, lithium fluoride, lithium chloride, lithium bromide, lithium iodide, the ionization, or not the ionization energy, but the energy of the bonds that are involved in that compound get weaker and weaker because they are getting further and further away from each other. The difference would be like this. <coughs> So I've got lithium and fluorine are going to be two atoms that are relatively small. If I had lithium and iodine, we're basically looking at the diameter or what's the diff distance between the midpoints of those atoms, or those ions. <coughs> and in this case, the distance between the midpoint between the lithium and the fluorine, fluoride ion is much shorter than what it is with the lithium if this is representing lithium iodide. So the further they get apart, the weaker the attractions. Just going back to this. If we compare the same um, going left to right, you got lithium fluoride, then we got beryllium fluoride. The difference here is that we've got a plus two for our beryllium and we get a plus one for the lithium. So we're increasing the charge. Increasing the charge is going to make the attraction stronger. I'm going to let you guys read through this. Let me know if you have any questions. Does anybody have any questions on the statements? Say again. <laughs> Most of their properties are going to depend on forces applied to them. So They're a little bit challenging because some of the some of the things that you guys like some of the stuff that you would could make that's a good luck. Like what? Uh, just water. 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 It's like glue and what? Water. Or just glue and water. It's just water, water and cornstarch. Oh, that's right. So 
over time, a lot of those will separate out. So the attractions are strong enough to hold things in place for a short amount of time, but over time you get probably the cornstarch and stuff to separate out away from the water. The properties for those things come from when the forces are applied and how are the forces distributed then through that. So if force is applied slowly, you're able to, to, to separate things apart and go into it. That's why you know, you've, you've seen videos, I'm sure, where they fill a pool full of cornstarch or whatever and stuff, and fill it with water and make it black, and you can walk into it gently and go into it. But if you were to jump on it, you're going to bounce off of it. Okay, so it's, it's how the force is applied that's given the properties. How those are working, I don't know. Okay. okay. Molecular solids. So a molecular solid is going to be a solid where it's made up of molecules held in place. Now, network covalent solids, they're covalent bonds between the particles. In a, in a molecular solid, you have molecules that are held together by covalent bonds but the molecules themselves are attracted by intermolecular forces. This is why we see a much lower melting points and boiling points compared to what we saw with the network covalent solids. Water melts at 100 degrees Celsius, boils at 100, or I'm sorry, melts at zero degrees Celsius, boils at 100 degrees Celsius, okay? It's a molecular solid <coughs> and the water molecules are being held together by intermolecular forces. They are not being held together by chemical bonds. That's what's <coughs> making Stop messing around with it. I kicked it, so I was trying to move it back. Stop messing around with it. What do you mean? I think it was unintentional. I think it's back. Now, uh, so <coughs> iodine. Iodine is a solid at room temperature. It does turn into a gas very readily. It turns straight from a liquid into a gas. It's sublime. Um, but it is a, it's a solid at room temperature. Why? Because the intermolecular forces between the iodine molecules are strong enough to hold it together in a crystalline shape. Questions about that? And then we have amorphous solids. Amorphous solids are they're not crystalline structure. They don't have a nice, neat, organized pattern to the molecules. <coughs> this is your silly putty. This is candle wax. Um, because you don't have that structure to them. Uh, I know on yours, yours is static, but on this, if you watch that over a couple of seconds, you see that that's a ball of silly putty that I rolled into a ball, set on a beaker, and, and just recorded it as a time lapse. I think that time lapse is maybe about 10, 15 minutes. So over time, you can see that that ball of silly putty, which is your non-Newtonian or whatever it is, it if I took that and I hit it with you know uh, threw it against the wall. It's going to stay the shape it was. But if I just set it there, it's going to deform over time. It, it, it goes back to the how is the force applied? Is the force applied quickly or is it applied slowly? <clears throat> this slide here is going to give you a rundown of each of the different properties. This is good for, you know, this is good knowing this. And having read through the, the text, this is going to be helpful when making comparisons between things. Look at the examples. I'm not saying to memorize them. Looking at the examples, though, may allow you to remember a couple of examples that may be used in the AP exam or that you could use in giving an explanation. Okay. <coughs> Questions?
Last set of slides. So in the process of melting or freezing, so a phase change is going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid that's melting and freezing. Vaporization is going from a liquid to a gas. There are different versions or different, uh, yeah, different versions of vaporization. The one you're, you're most familiar with is just going to be boiling, but evap well, you're also familiar with evaporation. <coughs> Um, so both of those, evaporation and boiling, those are vaporization. Condensation, that's really only one version of that. And that's going from a gas into a liquid. And then we have deposition and sublimation. I don't know why I have boiling on that line. Just scratch it out. I, I don't know why. Sublimation, deposition, that's going to be your phase change between solid and gas. So sublimation is going directly from the solid to the gas. Deposition is going from the gas directly into the solid. These two we don't see on a regular basis. Okay. I thought I had a slide for this, but I don't. One of the things that <clears throat> lab we do in the first year class is we have you boil water. Remember that? So in this, this is where I have solid only, liquid only, gas only. In this area right here, this is our melting or freezing, and this is going to be our boiler. And the reason why I don't have an opposite to this is that going from a gas to a liquid is a little bit different than going from a, a liquid to a solid. Remember what I said earlier, solids and liquids are more similar than liquids and gases. So if I were to take a substance as a solid, I would heat it up, and then I would get to the point at which it's going to melt, and the temperature does not change then. That doesn't mean there's no energy changes, it just means the temperature is not changing. Remember, temperature is kinetic energy, correct? So if I'm adding energy and the temperature is not changing, the kinetic energy is not changing. That means the velocity here is staying the same. Even though it's changing from a solid to a liquid, the velocity is still staying the same. The energy here is going into doing what then? So Grant, did you say it? I said no. What'd you say? Breaking the bonds. Breaking the bonds, breaking the attractions. So energy's gotta go into breaking the attractions. Now, when you're melting it, <coughs> does it break the attractions completely? No, it breaks them enough to make it a liquid. We break attractions completely when we boil stuff. The amount of energy required to boil a material away is gonna be very, very much different than what it is the energy required to melt it. It's gonna take a lot more energy. So, <coughs> once you finished melting, temperature can go up again, and it's going to go up until you get to the boiling point, and it's going to stay the same. And as you boil it, temperature is going to stay the same until it's all a gas and you can raise the temperature of the gas. The calculations involved on these, if you're dealing with energy, this would be your Q equals MC delta T part. How much energy is it going to do, uh, require to change the temperature? Or, here for a specific, I'm sorry, it's MC delta T. Okay. F. Same thing here. Oops. 
The C value is going to change because the amount of energy required to change the temperature of the solid is different than the amount of energy required to change a liquid, which is different than the amount of energy required to change a gas. These are going to be involve enthalpy changes where you use as a conversion. Remember, your temperature's not changing. You can't use this equation for this and this. Because your temperature's not changing, T would be what? Zero. So anything times zero is zero. <coughs> Question. Vaporization, evaporation occurs at the surface. So if I were to take this bottle of water and pour it out on the table, would it dry? Yeah. Yeah. Eventually. After that, for 20 years. 20 years? Yeah, probably. Well, like five long minutes. time. Like five minutes. I mean, it's pretty chilly in here. Maybe in about 30 minutes or so. 30 minutes, 20 years. So the, the, the process of that would be evaporation. So the surface of that water, that's where it's going to evaporate from. How could I increase that evaporation? Spread it around. Spread it around. Take my hand, just spread it around. If you have a liquid in a container, that liquid is going to evaporate until you get to the point at which the vapor pressure, so it's a gas, it's going to exert a pressure. That vapor is going to fill the container because it's a gas, and if the pressure, once the pressure gets high enough, no more molecules of liquid will be able to turn into a vapor unless some of the vapor turns into a, a liquid. And this is what we get a vapor equilibrium. So again, in this water bottle, if I keep the temperature in here the same, this water is going to evaporate to the point at which this, the maximum pressure is going to get for water, you're going to get for water, and then stop. The pressure will always stay the same. Doesn't mean that we're not going to have evaporation. We will. But we're also at the same time and at the same rate going to have condensation. So I was helping a couple of students out with uh, some of the questions dealing with vapor pressure. They were getting a little frustrated with it. And the reason why uh, they were getting frustrated with is because there's a maximum pressure here. When you go to do the work to answer those questions, the maximum pressure for this may be, call it 100. And the calculation that you have to do gives you 105. And you're going to see in the explanation that the AL calculates 105. It's counting it wrong because can the pressure get to 105? No, it can only get to 100. That means not all of it's going to evaporate, okay? And that's about it. There's not much to say about this other than you can tell what kind of intermolecular forces you have based on the curves. So at 40 degrees Celsius, the pressure of this is really low, the pressure of this is really high, that means this is going to have less intermolecular forces because it means it's easier to make it a gas. And that's basically all this is telling you. Questions? I'm done.
Hopefully you've done as much of the owls and stuff as you can. Now, I talked to you guys about when I changed the, did I talk to you last time about changing? So I changed everything to be the seventh now, AP classroom and owls. That way, you know, everything's done that same day. Don't wait until Wednesday after break to do it all. There's not going to be enough time in the days. Okay. 